Arc the Light Collection is made up of several adventures and introduces the origins of the 2D strategic RPG series. Arc is a young man who sets off to find his destiny and faces off against age-old menaces, gradually increasing his strength to challenge the ultimate evil. To be fair, it sounds like every other RPG ever made, but Arc the Lad presents a fresh and original take that never makes you feel like you're going through the motions. The heroes are extremely varied in their personalities and abilities, and each of the characters are fleshed out fairly well, so it's really easy to emphasize with them. Now I won't cover too much of the story as I'll be here all day, so let's jump into the gameplay. Unlike most RPGs, there are no towns and no real dungeons. Instead, it's mostly comprised of story sequences and strategic based battles. Now when it comes to combat, Ark the Lad is a great example of how to do it right. Your party is placed on a battlefield that is usually two or three screens long. Each character and enemy has their own field of movement represented by flashing tiles, and you must move your party over to where the attacking monsters are to confront them. Your team have a range of options available, from basic attacks to more devastating magical abilities. Of course, it wouldn't be an RPG without leveling up, and experience is dealt out each and every time you perform an attack. The key is to make all your characters as active as possible in every battle, so the levels will be fairly balanced. Overall, it all adds up to a truly engaging system. It now goes for around around $150 if you're looking to grab a physical copy and it's quickly rising in value. The PlayStation was no stranger to incredible RPGs, but one that often gets overlooked when discussing the console is Rhapsody of Musical Adventure. As the name suggests, music plays a huge role in the game, and sees players taking on the role of a young girl named Cornet, who essentially dreams of finding a handsome prince. Now what's funny is you actually fulfill this dream right at the beginning of the game, but it all soon goes to shit, with the main villain stepping in and turning the prince into stone. This naturally prompts Cornet to set out on a journey to not only locate him, but to bring about justice on those that harmed him. One of the main aspects that will instantly stand out are the incredible visuals that are presented in a gorgeous hand-drawn fashion. Each location and NPC you'll be interacting with literally pops to life thanks to the style of presentation, and really helps the world of Rhapsody feel alive. The battle system that's in place is turn-based in nature, and easily one of the better parts of the overall experience. Naturally, each party member has has access to a wide range of abilities, ranging from standard attacks to more impressive acts of magic that fill the screen and devastate your foes. Upon defeating them, they will often ask to join your party, which constantly adds new ways to tackle each battle. Of course, you'll be gaining experience points as you progress, as well as items and equipment that all increase your chances of success. Rhapsody and Musical Adventure really deserves a playthrough, but it will likely set you back around $150 if you're looking to grab a copy for yourself. Vanguard Bandits, which is also known as Epica Stellar in Japan, is one of those obscure Japanese games that would have never been released in the West if it wasn't for companies like Working Designs. It sees the player assuming the role of Bastion, a young man whose ultimate goal is to save the kingdom from the vile clutches of an empire. There are three main stories in the game, and while they all lead to about the same ending story-wise, they develop everything else differently. Because of this, it promotes several playthroughs in order to see everything the game has to Offer. Now as with most tactical RPGs, there is no real exploration to be had. It goes from event, to menu, to battle, to event, and so on. But the choices you make during these scenes determine what storyline you follow, and which battles you'll fight. When it comes to the battles themselves, it can at first be a bit strange. For starters, there's no basic attack command, and instead you choose an attack from a list of your abilities. Each of them consumes a certain amount of AP, which adds quite a bit of strategy to the game, as you can soon find yourself in a situation where you cannot move due to spending all of your points too early. It's a really delicate balance of risk versus reward. Now the most striking aspect of Vanguard Bandits are the visuals. When on the field it's your standard isometric setup, but when you actually engage with the enemy, you're plunged into a fully 3D environment for your units to carry out their attacks. Obviously it doesn't hold up well these days, but for the time it was quite impressive. But if there is one aspect of the game that lets it down, it has to be the localized at times, the dialogue is childish and juvenile. In fact, it is downright cringy during many of the character interactions. But if you can ignore this, it's definitely still worth giving a go. For the collectors out there, this one will likely set you back around $160. 
As far as tactical RPGs go, Tactics Ogre is undoubtedly a game to be remembered. It offers a huge, and I mean a huge, quest to complete, with storyline twists and challenging battles along the way. Add to that a group of conflicted characters, some really nice music, and fitting 2D visuals, and you have yourself the ingredients of something truly special. Much like Final Fantasy Tactics, the game does start off fairly slow, and introduces players to a young rebel known as Denim Powell, along with his friends who lead a revolt against an oppressive regime that's in place, which sees them travelling the kingdom. Now as the player, you need to make crucial decisions at certain points in the game, which will not only determine the advancement of the storyline, but also the development of Denim's character, the battles that he will face in the future, and the certain NPC party members you receive. Choice is a big part of the game, and because of it, it offers up a serious amount of replay value. Of course, no tactical RPG could survive on its own without enticing battles and Tactics Ogre more than provides. This game is not for the impatient or the brash. You will need to carefully plan out your battle and execute it with caution, since the battlefields are rather large and the player can select up to 10 characters per battle, it's quite common for each encounter to be long and drawn out. Of course, if you have the time, that probably isn't a problem, but for those of us who need to work, go to the bathroom or school, the game does offer an in-battle saving system, where you can save the exact moment of battle where you left off. It is really convenient. For fans of strategy, this is definitely a game to check out. But if you're looking to grab the game nowadays, it'll likely set you back around $175 for the privilege. Torneco is a spin-off of the popular RPG series Dragon Quest, and sees the popular merchant from the fifth mainline entry getting his own adventure. Now the game doesn't have anything to do with the main series, apart from reusing its world, enemies and music as a template to create something that it can call its own. It's essentially a dungeon crawler, with each of them being randomly generated and possessing their own theme and items to be found. Every time you enter one, you begin at level 1, that means that you have to explore and build up your levels every time you do, but if you spend too much time wandering around, your hunger meter decreases, so you have to base your decisions on the items you've been finding, and if it's worth it to carry on. Enemies and traps will rust your equipment, you could be put to sleep, and you could even end up being surrounded by monsters. If you're not always being as careful as possible, it is really easy for everything to fall apart. This is a necessary and great part of the gameplay, because you will almost never feel totally safe. As the game progresses, you discover more and more possibilities and challenges. These are introduced gradually, so you never feel overwhelmed, but eventually you can have access to many different dungeons and areas in the village that serves as a sort of hub, and you can take more items into dungeons with you in storage parts that make it a bit easier. Now in terms of presentation, the visuals are quite primitive, even for the PlayStation 1, and doesn't look any different to anything you would have seen on the Super Nintendo, but thankfully the gameplay more than makes up for it. Torneco The Last Hope is a solid adventure that was sadly misunderstood when it first released. If you're looking for a light-hearted but challenging RPG, this is definitely one to give a go, but with an asking price of $200, it might be too much of a stretch if you're not a collector. Kodalka is a rather special RPG, mainly because it takes place in my home country of Wales, and it's not often you see a game set here. You play as Kodalka herself, a mysterious young wanderer cursed with psychic powers, who is drawn for reasons initially unknown to the grim and dark Nemton Abbey. One of the first aspects of the game that many players will pick up on is the fact that the main heroine Kodalka is just a straight up bitch. To be fair, it was a pretty ballsy move from the developers to do this, as it's so easy not not to like her, and in some way it might have contributed to the game's muted success. I for one love it, especially the banter between her and the supporting cast, which really helps the narrative shine. As with any RPG, if a robust and engaging battle system is not in place, the game is going to fall straight on its ass. Thankfully, this is one area that steals the show. It shares a lot in common with the likes of Final Fantasy Tactics, and basically takes place on a grid. You have a certain amount of spaces you can move with each turn, as do the 
enemies. All of the spells and attacks have different levels of strength, which only rise if you use them consistently. And when you do, you're greeted with numerous glowing animations and musical stings whenever certain magical attacks are made. And as pretty as they are, you can breathe a sigh of relief knowing that they don't take half a fucking hour to play out. It makes the combat quick and decisive. Now thanks to the fact that the whole adventure takes place in one enormous location, it is rich in puzzles which may have the potential to annoy some players. Other than that, it's a solid adventure, and one that shouldn't be missed. If you're lucky to own a copy of the game already, then you can rest easy as it's now going for up to $250. Valkyrie Profile manages to mix platforming, puzzle solving and RPG elements all into one truly unforgettable adventure. It sees you taking up the role of Leonard, whose job it is to choose fallen heroes and deliver them to heaven. It all ties in heavily to Norse mythology and centers around the war of the gods known as Ragnarok. As I mentioned, several genres play a key role in the adventure. Traversing the environment primarily takes place from a side-scrolling perspective and involves overcoming several puzzles in order to progress. But what steals the show is the intricate and challenging combat system that manages to add an extra layer of strategy than most other RPGs. It's all centered around an energy bar that slowly rises the more you attack, with each party member being assigned to one of the face buttons on the controller. Once the gauge at the bottom of the screen hits 100, you're given the ability to unleash a variety of finishing attacks and chain several of them together, which soon becomes a real joy to pull off. The amount of experimentation that the game promotes lets Valkyrie Profile shine, making it a game that well and truly deserves a spot in any PlayStation collector's library. It's recently shot up in value and will set you back nearly $300 to do so. Whenever you ask an RPG player what their favourite series is, one of the many responses that you will always hear is the Tales franchise. Now Tales of Destiny 2 is actually Tales of Eternia that was previously only released in Japan. Namco decided to change the name when they brought it west in the hopes that it would appeal to more players. Now the game begins with two childhood friends, Reed and Farah, who are soon interrupted by a bright flashing light in the sky, which is accompanied by a huge, thunderous crash. Upon examining the crash site, they find a strange girl who can only speak an unknown language. They set out to find someone who can help her, and the plot only thickens from there. Now battles take place on a 2D plane. You can move, attack, use skills, guard, and all kinds of different commands. As with other battle systems in the series, you can also chain together regular physical attacks and skills to create combos that do a lot of damage and are a whole lot of fun to pull off. Another area where Tales of Destiny 2 shines is within customization. You learn new skills by performing the ones you already own a certain amount of times, as well as from doing various different tasks in the game. But to learn magic, you've got to acquire special crystals known as Kramals. You level them up from battles, and then combine or swap them around for different fusion combinations in order to learn new spells. It's a pretty interesting system, and although it's quite archaic by today's standards, it does provide a way for your character to flourish. All Although it doesn't quite hold up all of these years later, Tales of Destiny 2 is still a great adventure, and if you have a spare $310 lying about, you can give it a go for yourself. Sugoden 2 shares much in common with the previous entry in the series, but manages to introduce various new mechanics and ideas that help it stand out on its own. The narrative follows a group of childhood friends who find themselves plunged into the middle of a war, brought on by a prince of the kingdom known as Luca. After two of the friends disappear, the hero takes it upon himself to make a stand against the tyranny of the prince, and to hopefully reunite with his lost companions. Now what makes the adventure unique is the inclusion of several types of combat. There are three in total, which range from regular encounters, duels, and finally, massive battles. The regular encounters see up to six characters taking on enemies, with a whole range of abilities at their disposal. The duel encounters take on a sort of rock-paper-scissors approach, whilst the massive battles take place on a grid and share much in common with the likes of Fire Emblem. Having all of these separate styles of play present in one package, and each of them being as well thought out as the last, is an incredible incredible achievement, and really helps propel the experience into something truly unforgettable. Nowadays, the game goes for around $335, making it one of the most expensive RPGs on the PlayStation. 
Persona 2 was originally split up into two separate games in Japan. You had Innocent Sin and Eternal Punishment. Sadly, we only ever received the latter here in the West, and would have to wait until a few years later for it to completely release on the PSP. Now the story follows a young journalist in Japan called Maya. She's assigned to report on a rumoured Joker curse which has plagued the city with a string of murders. Shortly after she begins her investigation at the Seven Sisters High School, she begins to realise that there's more to these Joker murders than originally thought. Unlike most RPGs, the characters in Persona 2 don't actually use magic. Instead, the characters use what is called personas, which represent a person's inner self. Characters in the game can call upon these personas during battle to assist them by attacking, healing or using various other support techniques. Characters can also combine certain persona attacks as well as to create some rather devastating combos. What's neat about it is if you don't like the persona your character is using, you can create a new one from scratch. They're created using special tarot cards which you can obtain through encounters with enemies. The more tarot cards it takes to summon a new persona, the more powerful it will be. Now when it comes to battles, you can do all the typical actions such as standard attacks, use items, defend or use a persona which basically acts as magic. But one inclusion is quite unique and allows you to talk to the enemy instead. By doing so, it's possible to receive items or be healed and receive advice. It can be a bit confusing to get your head around the first, but it soon becomes an integral part to the overall gameplay. Eternal Punishment is quite easily one of my favourite RPGs, but with a price of nearly $350, I can only see collectors willing to part with that amount of money for just a single game. Well, that does it for today's video. Don't forget to hit subscribe and tickle that bell to stay up to date on future videos. You can also join our growing community on Discord and meet many like-minded gamers to continue the conversation with. I'd like to give a special shout out to our Patreon supporters Rhino, Skill Jim, Nano, Steve, Richard, Amy, Daniel, Marcos, NSG Reviews, and Paddy J for their continued support that helps make these videos possible. If you're interested in joining our Discord or supporting the channel through Patreon, to gain access to exclusive videos and giveaways for as little as $1 per month, you'll find the links in the description. As always, thanks for taking the time to watch the video. I'll catch you next time.